All right. Um, okay. I feel a bit like an Al Jazeera correspondent uh, right now, but um, thanks everyone for um, being here, which is, uh, is ironically somehow the title of the talk. Um, somewhat, it's actually being where. So let me bring up my screen with you guys. And hopefully everyone can see that. Maybe you can just sort of nod or, yeah, signal. Good. So, um, yeah, there isn't a great deal of time. And um, this is research is coming from quite a few years of research on mobile technologies and place and embodiment. Um, and it's therefore quite a dense um, piece of research that I've been working over. Um, for a number of years, including with Vendelin Coopers, who just uh, introduced himself, and we've published a couple papers of um, variations on this theme of um, interplace. And this is the key concept of the paper that we've been developing, um, particularly mobile interplacing, looking at uh, practices of mobile technologies and how they impact experiences of place and intersect with um, and get under the skin of the body. So um, it's quite fitting, I guess, that we're uh, meeting here in this virtual space uh, while we're all situated and emplaced in various other places as far away as um, Denmark and the South Island. Uh, I'm in Wellington, though, as you can see, I'm somehow a lecturer at Shamanad University of Honolulu. So people sometimes think I'm in Hawaii, but I'm in Wellington. Um, I teach online for Shamanad. So I'll get the paper underway and um, start by just sort of um, telling you a little bit about where it's going to go. Um, I'll give you a little bit of research background. Some of you know my research uh, quite well, others don't, so a little bit of context, um, followed by some of the guiding questions and observations um, that sparked this research, um, followed by some key concepts and theories, and, and into a discussion of both kind of empirical and theoretical uh, material on mobility, technology, and interplacedness and finishing up with some discussion of uh, other concepts uh, Vendelin and I have used, um, including a concept called Gistel, we get from Heidegger, um, and I'll explain more about that. And hopefully after that, there will be a little bit of time for discussion, because I would like to hear uh, your thoughts on this and, um, and, and just hear your thoughts and impressions and, and feedback. So, okay. Uh, away we go. So the background of this research um, is coming out of my PhD research, uh, which happened between 2010 and 13. Um, and I did a, a mobile ethnographic study of intersections between tourism and pilgrimage in the Himalayan region. So I did field work in Nepal and India. Uh, in kind of tourist hubs and hill stations like Dharamsala in northern India and Darjeeling in, in um, India, Kathmandu Valley, uh, Pokhara, and along some trekking routes there. Um, so this was a PhD thesis that um, then became a book, which was just published uh, in September this year, and I have it right here. So you can see it's really uh, materialized. Um, and the book, let's see, um, took a mobilities. Uh, anthropology is my, my disciplinary home, though I'm quite interdisciplinary and this work was really uh, situated in the framework of the mobilities paradigm, which many of you know quite well. Um, the methods I used were mobile and multi-sided ethnography, um, cultural phenomenology and philosophical anthropology, among others. It's, uh, it's full of different um, intersecting 
disciplinary approaches and theories. Um, and also it was both ethnographic in, in the sense of going out and traveling uh, in Nepal and India, meeting people, carrying out interviews, uh, but also research was done with people before they had traveled or after they had traveled, interviews on Skype, email interviews, um, so digital ethnography in a sense as well. Um, okay, so that's a little nutshell of the uh, research. Um, so moving into this particular area, um, some of the guiding observations and questions that began um, this work was when I went to Nepal and India, one of the first things I noticed was just how prevalent and omnipresent uh, mobile technologies and internet use was amongst travelers. Um, everyone I encountered beginning in Kathmandu seemed to travel with a smartphone and um, a laptop and sought out places that had Wi-Fi connections like traveler cafes, guest houses. Part of the selection process was about um, do they have Wi-Fi? And I was part of this as well. Um, and for the record, this was back in 2010, 2011. Uh, and so smartphones had been around for a while, but they weren't, you know, as, they were still a bit newer than they are now. This was exactly at the Arab Spring time. And I myself tra was traveling with a brand new iPhone, the first one I'd ever had, and a laptop so that I could, uh, it would help my research and allow me to stay connected. Um, but just watching other people engage with these technologies and watching myself engage with these technologies and the way we were tuning in from the experience of these places to go virtually digitally into other places and into other aspects of our lives at home um, it just really got me thinking and wondering what this means for the experience of travel for experiences of place um, what it means for our our embodied experiences and what kinds of ethical and polit potentially political implications this had, this hyper-connectivity um, that is obviously common at home, but is now in the context of travel also common. So this is a real spillover of, of the prevalence of technologies in our lives. Um, so this led me to try to um, conceptualize this and, and find, find a language for articulating what it what it means to be so connected across different places and so this uh led to the concept of interplace and i'll share um a quote from the um from the work which says uh in the introduction it says more than ever before travelers are able to imaginatively corporeally and virtually move through and be telepresent in many places and times at once in an increasingly interconnected world, possibilities for accessing and inhabiting multiple realities and becoming interplaced are intensified. So this was also motivated by um, some of the, the key earlier mobilities work of, of John Uri and Mimi Scheller and, and this early uh, sort of conceptualization of those interlappings of um, imaginative, you know, sorry, imaginary, corporeal, and virtual mobilities. And I wondered about the interconnections and overlappings between those. And so interplace was a way uh, I could try to get at that. Um, so some um, basic questions of where we are when we're using these technologies um, set me off in search of some answers. And I took some inspiration from phenomenologists um, like Martin Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. And I came across a few quotes that I use at the beginning of this, uh, these papers, where uh, the first, I'll read it, um, from Heidegger's essay, Building 
dwelling thinking. And he says, I'm never here only as this encapsulated body. Rather, I am there. That is, I already pervade the world and only thus can I go through it. Uh, so this quote suggests here that you are both in place here, but also you're elsewhere. And because you're in the world, your presence already is pervading and going outward into the world and then coming back to where you are. But um, I wondered about how this is possible and what happens when you mix these internet technologies with this um, more basic tendency. Um, and the other shorter, simpler quote from Merleau-Ponty just reads, my body is wherever it has something to do. And so the body is practical. Uh, and I combined this or thought of this with the technologies and thought, well, if I have something to do online, like connect with my family in California, or I have to check my bank account in New Zealand um, or do something, then part of me, part of my body or my bodily presence must be going elsewhere. And it's going elsewhere through these technologies. Um, so, so this gave rise to, to endless wonder for me and, and basic questions um, about basic things combined with technology. Um, so going into quite philosophical territory, um, I'll just go through this quickly, but uh, other questions, basic questions coming from Spinoza via Deleuze, um, where Spinoza asks, what can a body do? And suggests that we never know in advance what a body can do. We never know how we're organized and how the modes of existence are enveloped in somebody. So we don't really know actually the limits of uh, human potentiality and human bodies, especially when combined with technologies. And um, this has always been the case, but I would say the more technologies advance, the more we don't actually know what's going to become of us um, uh, embodied post-humans or cyborgs or... Uh, wherever we're going in the future with this. But coming back to the research a little bit, um, in order to conceptualize this concept um, interplace, I had to, in, in the paper, in the research, um, conceptualize place and space. And um, drawing on a lot of um, human geography and uh, um, work on, on place, um, I conceptualize in the paper uh, place as an event. So by event, this makes place temporalized um, because a place is something that's not just static, but a place is happening uh, all the time. And places aren't these bounded static containers, but they're ongoing, open, layered, um, practiced and emergent uh, processes. So um, a much more dynamic understanding of place um, is required. And if you really start thinking through, especially through a mobilities lens, you start to see that places are made up by all kinds of uh, motion and interactions between um, networks and configurations, um, humans and non-humans, information, capital, things, weather, traffic. Um, so this, uh, this stuff all kind of came together for me in both, this was, you know, literary type of uh, research, but um, I was observing this in the field when I was traveling through India and Nepal and watching places and thinking of them in this way. Oops, sorry. Um, so, Anyway, in a nutshell, um, we need a much more dynamic and temporalized concept of uh, place. And this, this is following an event ontology. But we can't have place, there is no place without the body. Um, so you, I needed to look at the emplacement of uh, embodied actors. Um, 
So living bodies uh, both mediate in places and navigate them. And they're both move within and towards places via what Merleau-Ponty calls primordial and sociocultural environing practices. Uh, so the way people negotiate places is, is cultural and social and political, but it's also primordial and biological because we're animals after all. Um, and people form relationships with place and by doing so co-create these places. And this leads um, the philosophical geographer Edward Casey to call them um, placescapes. And this brings, in, brings the body into, into conceptions of place. Or um, the geographer David um, Simon calls um, the way we move through places place ballets, these, these choreographed repertoires of how we move um, along routes as we go about our routines, because um, routes are also routines, as, as John Uri once pointed out to me, uh, or to us at a conference. Um, so place needs to be taken uh, in, along with um, the body. There is no uh, place without the body, so we need both. And I think everyone here probably agrees with that. Okay, so, but how do places become, um, or how do people become interplaced in these um, dynamic moving spaces? Um, so let's get into that. Um, but actually, what we're going to get into is um, some of the, an ethical question, actually, that's also in this research um, on interplace. Uh, and the question comes actually also from Casey in an essay where he asks, what do wireless technologies mean for us embodied human beings? So this is something I wondered in the context of my um, field work when I was in Nepal and India. I wondered, what does it mean for us to be online so much? And how does this alter our experience? Um, and, and what does it mean for the ethics of interacting with people? So how, um, what's the difference between embodied face-to-face -face virtu vir versus communicating across a virtual interface? Um, Casey and others argue that certain things get lost in face-to-face, -face, um, corporeal, mutually in place situations. Um, you know, for instance, we're facing each other right now, but through the interface of the screen um, in, in very different places. And some would argue that things are missing here, little cues where we read from one another, or just simply the feeling of, in, of being in a shared atmosphere. Um, so other questions related to this are just, what is the ubiquity of media and this omnipresent availability or the sense that we're always available because we travel with smartphones and we have iPads and computers um, around us, and we're on them for hours oftentimes of the day, sometimes more hours than we're not. Um, so what does this mean and where is this taking us when we're so hyper-connected that it leads to another form of disconnection from place or from possible encounters with embodied others? Um, so those are some of the questions we start, I start um, started asking and don't have all the answer don't have the answers for but um, but there's certain critical I, things that need to be reflected on with uh, with our technologies but on another sort of just more philosophical and sort of metaphysical level um, I wonder and, and chase up in the paper of it the status of um, technologically mediated presence so this idea that somehow technology, because it's virtual, means that it's not real or um, virtual reality. How real is it? Or um, it's like this parallel, non-material realm. But um, 
I kind of used to think that way, but as I got into this topic, um, I changed from that and came to see that actually our, um, our mediated presence through technology is still embodied nonetheless um, in the sense that we are still being, we're still extending ourselves and we're affecting others just like I'm affecting you right now with my, my words and my expressions. And this is having an embodied effect on you. And I'm seeing you there somewhere out there. Um, and seeing you there is affecting me on an embodied level. I can feel it in my nervous system. Um, so this all made me, you know, have to get more complex with how I, how we think about, uh, technologies and the internet. Um, so some of this work has already um, been, been done and sketched out um, and, and really helped me think through the, some of these things. And one book that really helped me um, along the way was the 2010 book by John Uri and Anthony Elliott called Mobile Lives. Um, and this is a very good book, a kind of really rich ethnographic account um, quite ahead of the game, I, I think. And in the book, um, Uri and Elliot write how in conditions of intensive mobilities, the self becomes deeply layered within technological networks as well as reshaped by their influence. And one of the things they talk about in the book, which I noticed in my research, um, both in terms of myself doing it and watching other people do it, is the way um, mobile and internet technologies allow for the storal, storing and retrieval of affects. And by this I mean photos, music collections, um, all of these things can be stored in our devices and accessed at any time, anywhere. So when I was in Nepal, I'd be traveling on a, you know, eight hour bus ride and I'd have my smartphone charged up and I could uh, I could look at pictures of um, on the phone I could access my music I could take all these things that kind of make make me part of partly who I who I am um, and I could access those from there and that would have an embodied effect on me at the time meaning it affected my experience of Nepal and of the place I was in um, but another uh, new sort of territory of, of, of all this is um, what's called the, um, or being called, the capacity for passive sensing and feed forward of new 21st century media. Um, and this is coming from some work by a uh, media theorist called Chad Hansen um, at Duke University in the States. And he writes about how the internet now has this life of its own and our devices are sensing things and, and feeding media, social media or Google is, you know, keeping track of searches and therefore it's shaping what, what we do and, and thus how we feel because it has a feed forward effect on us. So this goes beyond even our agency um, to go and, look for certain things instead it gives them to us all already and um that's that's a big sort of um a new area so but i don't have time to get into that but coming back to some of the useful um new vocabulary um that that's in the article that is um from the literature and all oops sorry um and is also some of the things um, Bendelin and I have come up with. Um, again, from that Mobile Lives book of Uri and Elliot, um, they use the term miniaturized mobilities to talk about um, smartphones and tablets and mobile devices that help or afford us our lives on the move. We can, these things help us live mobile lives. We would, we, barely could do it without it. We buy tickets on them. We um, keep our bank accounts and credit cards paid on them. We Skype our friends and family and everything. So um, 
so that's one term, um, maybe not the greatest term, but at the time seemed like a good one. Um, another term though that I found quite powerful and still do is um, what they call the technological unconscious. Um, and what they mean by that, they don't talk about it much, but I talk about it somewhat in, in my book and the paper, is the way that technologies continue to be utilized or in use even when we're not using them. And I noticed this in the field when I was in um, remote parts of Nepal and India uh, on sort of around trekking routes and in, in sort of these frontier outpost kind of villages where internet availability was um, either non-existence or, or really sketchy. And what this term technological unconscious means is, um, yeah, that even when you're not using the technologies, things are happening in your mind reminding you um, that you're not and that perhaps you should be, that emails are piling up, that there's people, there's things you need to do online, there's things waiting for you. And the travelers I met in Nepal and India talked about this and how it was both a kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time. They uh, sort of enjoyed um, the freedom to be away from these, uh, the constant connectivity, but it gave them anxiety as well, um, which shed some light on our um, technological addiction um, in contemporary society. So, um, so that was quite interesting, and that's something I don't see lessening. If anything, it's uh, probably going to increase in the future. Um, but I see the time going, so I need to move. Um, but portable personhood is another term that, you know, this is possible because of our technologies. Um, technological dead zones is another, is related to the unconsciousness. Uh, um, and those are places where you can't access um, um, the internet. Um, anyhow, moving to our terms, Vendelin and I, um, interplace and digital gestel is, uh, is what we bring to the table of this discussion. So um, I'll just briefly um, tell you about how we sort of conceive this. So along with all the, um, the work on place and embodiment and um, places as these configurations that mean places and bodies are in, in connection with all kinds of other places and bodies, um, we look to actually Heidegger um, to kind of try to understand this as a more basic process. So um, Heidegger writes about in, in Being in Time, his first and major work, um, that human beings have this tendency to what he calls de-distance or bring near. So people project themselves um, through space and make things, bridge the gaps between themselves and others and things in the world, um, which is in another way of saying they bring them near to this nexus of, of action. And so I took this, this basic idea, this kind of very, you know, core idea, and applied it to ask what happens with digital technologies. And what I think is happening is that these technologies simply augment what is already our spatial orientation, um, which is that tendency to extend and bridge distances and bring things near to us. And in a globalized world, this means, um, which is networked and technologized, this is all um, happening on a, on a much larger scale than a local environment. Um, so the key ideas here are technology and media, both and together as a bodily extension, which allows us to overcome distance. Um, and that's the basic idea. And this has um, been worked out in a very different context by a, a really well-known, important paper in philosophy of mind called the Extended Mind Hypothesis by uh, Andy Clark and, and Chalmers. 
which posits that actually cognition um, doesn't take place within a single mind, but actually takes place in a space um, between people, that, that cognition is not isolated in, inside one's skull, but takes place in, in space between bodies. Um, and then there's been work since that calls this the extended body hypothesis. So that's kind of what inner place is getting at. Um, this idea of extension outward, and in this case, on a planetary level. Um, moving on, we're almost getting, getting to the end. I won't get into uh, Marshall McLuhan, but um, this is all made possible by uh, fundamentally electricity and the technologies that have developed out of that. But along with um, inner place, moving to our other concept, uh, which is a more critical concept, uh, this also is from Heidegger, it's the concept of gestell, which means enframement in Germany, um, or in German. And um, so Wendel and I in the paper talk about how we are these days enframed by our uh, technologies. And Heidegger talks about technology as a historically specific way of revealing the world. Um, and in modernity, the world shows up as this, what he calls a standing reserve, just this material earth that's there to be used and transformed and exploited um, for human purposes. Um, so I took this idea of standing reserve and, and applied that to the way people are approaching global mobility these days. And my idea from interviewing travelers and who are on these around the world trips with their technologies was the world appears to them as this global standing reserve um, or a planetary lands landscape as Marc Auger calls it. Um, and for me, this is a, a very technological way uh, of thinking about the world, that it's all there to be traveled around and through, um, and that's how it appears in, in our um, information society. So, finishing up, um, the paper uh, and this research is about what it means to travel, to dwell, and to be in the world, which is so technologically mediated and uh, increasingly mobile. And, uh, towards the end of the paper, Bendel and I ask um, critical, um, ethical, and political questions about what this means. And um, this tendency to approach the world as this standing reserve of places to, to just move through and, and play in and consume calls for more place uh, conscious and place responsive um, orientations and uh, one way we suggest we actually get a little bit normative in the paper and we we, um, we sketch out uh, again inspired somewhat by Heidegger uh, what we call an ethos of Glassenheit and Glassenheit is a German term roughly translate as letting things be um, and I don't have time because uh, the clock is ticking but um, it's a a mode of practice and thinking um, in which we release our way of thinking from, um, from this instrumental of, of, uh, of doing. And instead we turn the devices off and we tune into places and become present to them in a non-utilitarian, non-instrumentalized way. So that's, um, what we're starting to get at with the, uh, with glass and height. Uh, but again, this, this is quite a dense um, paper and um, topic, I, th I think. So um, I hope I've done some justice to it and that made some sense. And uh, hopefully in the, in the future, um, you know, I think this area has a lot of, still there's a lot of work to do on what, what our technological evolution means for us and where we're going with this. And if you're interested to read more and um, connect some of the dots I, I only introduced here, um, this paper is in my book, Mobile Life Worlds, uh, 
I sound like a salesman, but um, it's also coming out in a paper um, in the journal Transfers, um, probably early next year in the journal Transfers, a mobilities journal. And if you read Spanish, it's already in a Spanish translation in a journal called Scripta Nova. Um, so thanks very much for your uh, time and attention and being here or there. And um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I would love to have uh, hear some comments or impressions or questions. And I'll stop sharing my PowerPoint now. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome. <laughs> that was just great. That was a lot of material in a short amount of time, but a fantastic yeah. lot to think about. Um, I particularly like the way you started with the idea that place was an event because that's quite a challenging concept just in itself. And I noticed in the paper, you also said mobility is an event. And mm. I thought that was quite an interesting way to understand the dynamics of things happening mm. you know, in process. And so it, it laid nice groundwork for, for those other conceptual things that you were trying to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what we might do is open it up to uh, comments and thoughts from people. Um, you don't have to ask a question if you just want to give an impression or a thought. And um, it seems that sometimes the best way to get people's attention is just to raise your hand, like physically in front of the camera, if you feel like saying something. Um, but, you know, uh, so should we do that? Should we just see if people have some things to contribute and just thoughts after hearing Chris's paper? Tara? Let me unmute. Uh, um, thank you, um, Chris. That was really, really interesting uh, and made me think of, of lots of different things. But one of the things I was thinking through was when you were sort of talking about uh, imaginative, corporeal, and, and virtual movement, uh, I, I just wondered what your thoughts were on how history fits into that. Because obviously we're talking a lot about the digital era and where we are now, but how do we look backwards as well as forwards and, and bring all of that into, uh, into thinking about uh, mobility? Mm. Yeah, thanks, Tara. That's, um, that's a good question. And one, one, I remember I had, I presented this material at a conference once and I had a similar question. Somebody asked me something to the extent of, um, said well what's is this really new or is um because people in the, or is this just a faster way of writing letters or sending postcards when you send the photos and emails and, um so that's that's a valid point and question um what i think is different now is um the temporality of it that i think these are all this this isn't like totally new stuff um and that's why I guess in the paper we try to get, get it to a very basic level about embodiment and presence and that these technologies simply augment what we can already do as, as human beings. Um, so um, one could probably do a nice history of this and probably have, but um, what I think is distinct and, and new here is the temporality and the the fact that it happens like instantly or almost instantly there isn't the lag so when you know hippies in the 60s and 70s went to india and they sent their postcards or letters back it took weeks for them to get to their family or for them to receive mail and they'd have to pick it up this is all happening in the moment um so you know people are sending photos they literally take um, you know, in, it's funny, it's telling. In, in the paper I wrote, which was in 2011, I said, sometimes I sent photos I'd taken only hours before, and that was in 2011. Now it's like seconds before you Snapchat them or um, flick them off and get feedback instantly. And what I think is different then is that when you get that instant feedback, it changes your experience in the moment whereas that didn't happen in the past when you were a bit more cut off um, and you had to just kind of go with the experience. So, um, yeah, I think everything is getting, it's the acceleration of it, um, the urgency of it. Um, there's a book or an article that 
by a Swedish uh, theorist that he, I think he calls it the tyranny of the moment um, that we're, you know, yeah, so. Can I just add in there, um, there was also an added element, wasn't there, Chris, that it's not just, because I was thinking of traveling as well, uh, you know, myself in the um, 70s. It's not just that you uh, are replacing the act of going to the post office or go, finding a postcard and then going to post restaurant and then sending the postcard. And you're trying to think, you know, granny and great aunt, so and so on, I'd have to send a postcard. But it's actually that people you interviewed were saying, um, because it's ubiquitous, I'm thinking I should be sitting down and sending a blog right now about this. And then mm -hmm. they went to the next place. And, but I really should be send, sitting writing about this. And mm -hmm. so it was interrupting their ability to experience place. Right. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. That's true. And, and so that's a similar thing. Both we still have this kind of social pressure to share um, by, you know, sit and write the postcards. I got to, you know, get some time for that. But these days it's, you know, I have to do it. It becomes a real imperative and it does cut into people's time. And I, I sort of observe people in, in Nepal and India and they would spend between an hour or two, sometimes much more, all day on Skype, on the internet. So um, it's, a, it's a pressure that is a um, autopoetic process. I think mm. it feeds itself. The more we f people feed it, it feeds back to them and um, so demanding. Yes, Bendelin, did yeah, you want to add in? Yeah, this is, um, <clears throat> but this is highly ambivalent, of course, in that regard that uh, you gain something and you lose something. You know, I think we need to be aware that this is not just uh, to be, you know, um, seen in one way, but uh, because um, on the one hand, you know, you are relating the relationship, you are, you, you list, you're losing the relationship to the place, but you may, might get also a different kind of relationship to the same. So I, I think, you know, it's, uh, Chris spoke about augmentation, you know, but at the same time, also there's this, uh, you know, you are not situated. So it's, it's, it's both. You are also enriched and impoverished. And I think this is quite important, fascinating. And this is not only in mobility, but in other usages of modern media in general. You know, and uh, also Heidegger is not just demonizing technology. On the contrary, you know, he says it's revealing. It's something that's disclosed. You can learn something from it. And I think this is quite important to, to see always these, these two sides, the potential and the danger. Mm -hmm. so this is very important because otherwise it's, it's too easy to criticize this as uh, something is only lost, something is gained as well. And I think we need to see these, these dimensions of uh, mm -hmm. what, is, what is enabled also and what has also been you know, lost. And uh, I think this is quite important. Otherwise, we are falling to a one-sided trap which is not doing justice to these complexities. Mm. Yeah, mm. do you want to address that, Chris? Maybe some more, maybe you could talk a bit about your interviewees? Um, yeah, I, I heard in people and observed, yeah, a kind of ambivalence, a sense that like, that sort of, well, it was, a, it was strange because, you know, you're traveling, the idea is to experience a place and have new experiences, um, to not, and to kind of, hasn't the idea always of travel or been this ritual inversion of, um, you know, you leave and you're liminal and your, your life is kind of on, out on hold. Um, and it's a dropping out of, of your life at home. So what happens when your life follows you with you, wherever you go, it's in your pocket, in your device. And that opens up all kinds of possibilities, um, for people both. Yeah. For good and, and for bad, it makes the mobile life, possible you can live on the move you can work on the move um and i've done plenty of this this um my, i think my phd thesis was written across like many places but i was in like 10 different countries at during the whole process and and people i was interviewing and meeting were working on all kinds of projects while they were on the move and so um this allows for this kind of cosmopolitan mobility and, and there's some great things to that and they were happy about that. But yeah, the pressures, the imperatives, um, the dependency uh, and, the, and the urgency, I think, is some of the things that are um, causing people anxiety and um, leading to technological addiction and um, 
Um, so, but it's true what Vendelin said that we can't look at this one sided in any way where it's absolutely untenable to be a technophobe these days and just say, you know, it's, it's bad. It's, you know, rotting our brains. It's, um, it's here and it's only going to increase. So we need to see it in all the different lights. And that's why I just think it's really important to theorize, uh, and do research on technology because it's so pervasive and, um, um, and there's, yeah, still a lot of work to do, I, I think. Um, so we need to know how it works. We need to know the dangers and um, the potentials of it. And, and Heidegger said, actually, um, you know, I think he quotes um, Holderloin, the poet, who says, where, the, uh, where there's danger, the saving, uh, how does, where there is danger, there's um, potential as well, something like that. Okay. Um, uh, Anne would like to say something or uh, raise her hand and contribute. So we'll just let her in here. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thank you for this talk. It was, uh, I really like the way you connected the different um, approaches. Uh, I have a comment for this discussion. Um, uh, I don't know if you know Jenny Jemaine Maltz, I think her name is. Mm -hmm. uh, who also works on, um, like you, on, on how the digital technologies support travelers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but she, uh, she relates it also to how, uh, who the travelers are, mostly young people going to the Himalaya with backpack and etc. Yeah. And see the, the way they use the digital technologies, uh, as you're talking about now, which would be um, immediately online and then... Um, post whatever they're doing as a way of formation of their self. Uh, you might find something with her. Um, and I, I don't know if you have a comment for this, that uh, not all travelers are the same. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's different for, for the young people uh, traveling like that. And then I have a different question, which is more about power uh, and the way that uh, in your perspective with uh, with your studies, uh, when you look at place and interplacing, and I really like this concept, how this impacts the way mobilities are produced. So how, because you've been talking about uh, how it affects um, self or place making and a place as event and mobility as event, but this way of uh, um, experiencing place and um, constituting place, how this affects the way mobilities are shaped and formed for the people. Um, who are traveling and through this also via the digital technologies thanks mm -hmm. okay um, yeah thank, thanks Anne for the uh, comments and, and questions and um, and yeah it's, it's a very good um, good point and, and something I should have probably qualified um, that yeah of course all travelers are not the same and we need to be really careful not to um, Basket and, and homogenize them. Uh, and I use the term traveler actually as opposed to tourist or pilgrim because those concepts are so problematic and um, not that travel better, but um, yeah, demographics uh, are, are important and you know, you can't generalize. Um, and even, yeah, it is more the younger generations who are, um, so bound with these technologies um, and maybe not as much the older generations, but not necessarily so. That could also be the reverse. There's older people these days that are just as online as young people and, and vice versa. And um, there's some young people that are actually distancing and, um, and new trends are developing too. Like I, I've seen the, a resurgence of flip phones, like simple flip phones, because some people don't want to have smartphones anymore. So things are, are changing. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right about not totalizing everybody together um, there. Um, and I do know the work of, um, of Jenny Germaine Moles quite well and we, we cite her in the paper and um, she does really excellent work in this area um, that inspired me a lot. Um, so, but you're, you're, the question of, of power is a, is a really good one and a big one. And um, 
something I didn't talk about much, but is, is really important as I think probably everyone here knows in, in mobility's research is knowing um, the material infrastructures that support and enable mobilities and what's behind that. Because, um, you know, with studies of globalization and ideas of, you know, liquid modernity and fluxes and flows, it can all begin to look a bit um, fleeting, <laughs> ephemeral, and um, and immaterial. But there is a material infrastructure behind the internet and behind these technologies that are produced in factories um, in China, and the materials that are in them are coming from many different countries and and using materials that are scarce and highly polluting. Um, so these are questions of power. Um, companies that, that, you know, the whole travel transport infrastructure, I think, needs to be always taken into account and in all the material um, dimensions of mobility, and including the political uh, structures that are, are allowing this, along with issues of, of like, social class and um, citizenship and, and this ability to just move around the world, this represents a very unequal situation um, in terms of which country you're coming from. I mean, there's a reason most of my participants were from Western Europe, um, North America, by which I should say it's United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, so people of, of pri relatively privileged um, middle-class backgrounds. So. Yeah, I think critically that needs to be taken into account. Um, and um, I think a lot of people are doing that and um, in critical mobility studies. And um, yeah, I tried to do that. I just, I guess, didn't spotlight it probably uh, in this paper much. Yeah, this is... Uh, Over to Vendelin. Can I just add, yeah. So th those being traveled need to be considered and also <laughs> Um, we are political in that regard that I understand Gelassenheit as political program in a way. You know, if you are resisting a certain usage of uh, technology and, for example, defining designated times, then you are reclaiming autonomy for yourself and not playing certain games. And I think in this regard, also being, you know, in this kind of letting go mode is political in a way. And as I see that, You know, my, my students are irritated that I'm not using mobile phone, for example. And this, this is a quite a topic for discussion. And I'm, I'm political at the moment because of that. So I think we are, our usage of modern technology is also political in which, in one way or the other. Mm, yeah, good, good point. So yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting how non-participation is, is also a form of political participation and non-doing refusing to just do it is um is a, a form of protest so um yeah and taking agency back into the hands and um i guess what we kind of advocate in the paper is um yeah using technology for all that it allows but not being used by it and that's a political um, that's a political issue okay anybody who hasn't had a chance oh yes uh Catherine? and Sorry, was that Anita? I wasn't sure. Catherine, why don't you go? Yes, hi. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, I, I found that really interesting and, and, you know, lots of ideas are running around in my head, but I just, I jotted down a couple of things, just the way that you expressed things, actually. Um, so you said, um, right at the beginning, you said, uh, you are here, but you are also elsewhere. And I was interested in the way that elsewhere suggests an othering of some places. Um, also, uh, when you said, when you, you talked about when you, uh, you go to the bank or when you go to the Cal California, you said, is part, of my, part of my body is going there. And I don't know that part of your body is going there. I think part of yourself is going, but I'm not so convinced that part of your body is, is <laughs> going to the bank, you know, when you go online to do your banking. Um, then, then you said, uh, uh, Oh, yes. Uh, then I asked myself a question. Are, are people interplaced or are they multi-placed? Because inter to me suggests an in-betweenness. And so, yeah, I, I, 
uh, I'm, I'm querying the idea of inter rather than than, than multi. Um, and then when you said that there is um, there is no place without the body, and it reminded me of that that thing that people say that you know that kind of riddle: if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it. Mm. Did it make a sound? Mm. Um, and you know, is there a place without a body? Somehow that that idea came into my head. So um, I, I know that's a bit of a, a, a rather disparate uh, rambling of different ideas, but they were just things that sparked in my mind as I was listening. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That you you, lis you listen closely as always. Um, and um, yeah, so to try to weave those together. Um, I think um, first of all, this 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 stuff could be called. This is a bit speculative in a way, and so even as I was working this out and and working with Vendelin, um, I've always had this kind of half doubt in my mind that this is actually what's happening and this is actually possible that people can be interplaced. Um, that if I'm using the devices. Um, that part of myself or part of my body is actually going elsewhere. This really messed with my mind and my, my you know, ontology and epistemology about things. Um, and it, 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 it troubled me for a long time and, and still does. So I'm not settled with these as like, you know, I've defined it, inner place. It's the concept. Um, you, you have a point about multi-placing. Um, that, that, you know, um, you're connected to multiple places. Um, but anytime you're connected, there's always, I think, an in-between that's connecting you. So just like when you use technology, the device, it's not like a self and a discrete object in itself. Um, Heidegger and, and Merleau-Ponty and phenomenologists would say, if you say these things are separate, you're missing the relation between them that makes this relationship possible. And um, so I, I put some of myself in this and it feeds back and we're in a relationship um, and we do things together, uh, like go to the bank virtually. And I guess what I mean by that, uh, and yeah, in a way, what you said is right, that it's maybe not my physical body that's going into cyberspace um, but it depends on how you define a self if you say you think it's yourself and if you define yourself differently from the body then then you're falling into those kind of dualisms the the dreaded uh, Cartesian dualisms um, and so for me after lots of thought and reading and thinking um, I don't think of myself as separate from my my body and my body also you know my conscious presence is physical and it's it's part of my body so when that goes out um and does things uh i do think there's something to that idea of um it going out and particularly what what i think proves it is that when things come back it has an effect on you and your physical existence um it affects you um, in a lived sense. So, um, could I add something, Chris? Cause you did in the paper talk a lot about tools and sort of the use of the technology is more than the looking or the listening at the screen, but it, you know, you're typing, you're sitting down, you're like, you're talking about being in a place in Kathmandu and another person was at their screen. Both of you had a tool, even though you're both concentrating on emails going somewhere. So, there was quite an embodied element, even though the body didn't go to the bank in Wellington. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I don't yeah. Know, I just... yeah, so yeah, thinking of these technologies similar to just basic tools, I think is, is important. Um, and the way basic tools are interwoven into our embodied existence. So, you know, for example, like the example Merleau-Ponty gives is the blind man with his cane feeling around the cane is an extension of his arm and his body. He navigates the world with his cane. Or Heidegger talks about um, eyeglasses and how, you know, eyeglasses are a technology, but I'm wearing them, or, or Martha, you're wearing them, and we are seeing the world slightly different physically because of it, but we don't 
think about that or we don't notice that it's interwoven in our uh, experience. So I don't think we can easily separate these things. Um, and humans um, have always been, you know, in our evolutionary history, in deeply involved in technologies and that's defined us and how we've evolved beginning from stone tools. So um, yeah, thinking of them as advanced as they are, thinking of them as tools is quite powerful, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else want to contribute or make a comment or? Anita? Um, I'll just be brief. Thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, what did me think about um, when I was on holiday in Argentina earlier? I really enjoyed not having the internet all day and using actual maps navigate my way around and that sort of thing um, if you think about Heidegger's model of sort of most inspired dwelling and staying in one place then you can think about um, people now if you were to be born in one place and stay there your whole life it's almost a form of this employment and everything that takes us in the world so I was wondering it's almost a little bit of an angle like saying you know, that switching off or not participating is a political move, but, but could it visit some wider sort of sense of room? Can you hear? Can you hear that? Uh, no, I'm missing. I'm either? missing. I'm Just, getting bits and pieces. I suppose, of it. like a conscious choice. Yeah. And they, against they the forces keep really keep coming in. And is it only going to get harder through this potentially? I'm just I'm not sure. Question in there. Yeah, Anita, I can't uh, I can't fully hear the whole thing. It's sort of choppy. We're getting dissonance. Can you see? Uh, I mean, is Anita uh, moving? Or is she gone all, it's like pausing now. Maybe I'll Sorry. type it. Okay, try um, typing something. Check on Anita's chat and she'll see if she'll type something. All right, let me take a look. Oh. Okay, Anita, no, I don't see any message. Do you, Martha? And now I lost my sound. Um, Looks uh, like Anita's got um, poor broad bench width, I'd say. Mm, mm. Yeah, it looks very slow. Uh, <laughs> Are these guys? Sorry, that just shut off. No, that's okay. Can you try again? Oh, she's going to shut it off again. I guess she's going to try and come back in again. Did you catch? I'm not quite sure what she was. I caught a few bits and pieces. Um, I could I could try to put together where I think she was going, but I'm not sure if that's the case. But she was talking about traveling in Argentina, and mm -hmm. um, she enjoyed being offline and using real maps, like non-digital mm -hmm. paper maps, which sounds like kind of a nostalgic... Um, that sounds kind of fun, actually, to use paper maps um, these days. Um, instead of being tracked on your GPS. Uh, and I think she was talking about dwelling in one place and what it would mean to, um, to, to not travel, maybe just to dwell in one place and stay there. And that would be quite a different, that would go against some of the um, um, 
the modern cosmopolitan ideal of freedom and mobility. And, and so mobility is one of the chief values, I think, of, um, you know, so-called modern um, Western society, or not even Western, but uh, um, this idea in late modernity, being mobile is one of the main values. Um, so to not do that, again, that could be a, a political gesture that could be a way of not consuming, not buying into it. And that could be some, has and could become something more important as people um, wake up to climate change, um, the carbon footprint of air travel, and then something John Uri was writing about um, as after he developed, you know, after writing on tourism, he went into climate change. And um, yeah, the air travel is... Um, highly polluting so um um yeah and even like thinking of academic mobility and i've questioned myself this academic lifestyle to travel and go to conferences and travel halfway around the world to present a 20-minute paper and meet a few people and have a couple drinks and and then go back so um that's uh you know, even doing something like this, we are, you know, this is, is already and maybe the future of teleconferencing. Um, you know, it's so not in Chris, so going to Rome, but um, yeah. it's, it's uh, <laughs> for a nice conference holiday, <laughs> but um, it's more is sustainable. So this is one of the good things, again, about technology. Yeah. And Anita's just written some messages. Oh, um, whether using technology as a form of resist, uh, not using the technology becomes a form of resistance. And that resistance may continue to be so over time as mobilities increase. So she's uh, agreeing with you. And then, you know, sort of like you said, you saw the flip phones. People said, no, we, I don't want video and I don't want to be tracked. I don't, I don't want Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that they might make those selections as an um, aspect of resistance. Right. Or, or just not being so extreme about it and doing something like Vendelin was suggesting, like deciding, you know, mm -hmm. when and where you're going to do it, setting limits, um, digital fasting, deciding I'm going to go offline for this amount of days. Um, and even, yeah, some luxury hotels. I read an article in... I don't know, the New Yorker, the New York Times, some really high-end luxury hotels now are marketing themselves as having no internet availability. They're in remote places. So this is going to become a luxury, you know, for the uh, leave your device at home and disconnect. So yeah, we, we could see a sea change because, you know, things are always evolving. So, um, but I think, again, back to the point of we need to see technologies for what they can do and enable and not demonize them completely because if you take yourself completely offline you're going to be missing out on a lot of information and um things that you could do that, and you'll whether you like it or it's a big it's a big move because you're going to get left behind um that could be good or if it's a big a big call i think i i can I can I say something? You know, I, I liked I liked Anne's idea uh, of dwelling. You know, because um, Heidegger is contrasting dwelling with building, and a lot of mobility is building up. You know, in in a figurative sense. You know, you know and and um, and I think we you know there's this movement towards mindfulness and presencing and being in the moment and uh, and you know taking qualities in situ, you know, situationally, and dwelling has this connotation also, this kind of quality of really, you know, being there where you are, and not, not always lost. And I think, uh, therefore, perhaps a revival of a different form of dwelling makes sense. So Anne's, Anne's idea is quite interesting. And it could be interesting just to consider what would dwelling mean in our mobile age. Is that Anita? Anita, yes. Oh, sorry, know. yes. Okay, Anita, good. Yeah. Yeah. Anita's point about, you know, re learning to dwell again instead of moving always and not arriving at all. Mm, yeah. Would both of you, Vendel and, and Chris, see dwelling as slower? You yes. know, given the last part of your paper where you're talking about slowing down a bit to be present, do you think it does dwelling have something to do with speed and de decelerating? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Definitely. I mean, I think if you're, if you're just dwelling and you're emplaced in one place um, and you're really tuning into the rhythms and atmosphere of that place, then that's, that's a slower and more conscious process where you're not pulled and pushed and pulled in all these directions and this fleeting experience um, that you're just doing a drive by through these different um, fleeting spaces. Uh, I think dwelling is uh, a really situated, a really present um, mode of, of being there. Um, and not only conscious, but also being in resonance. I'm reading Rosa at the moment, a German uh, researcher who's doing research about resonance. And I think if you dwell, you are swinging, relating to where you are differently than just uh, moving through. And I think the quality of uh, relating, the inter, which is constitutive and which can be multiple, is uh, different if you are somehow dwell, not completely. Um, I think it's in between being a complete nomad versus being complete immobile. And I think you, you are moving and you are really moved by dwelling. So it's not just, you know, settling down. It's not this kind of, uh, you know, passive, you are just there and nothing else happens. You are differently moved by dwelling in a mindful way. Mm -hmm. And not only, not only mindfully in, in the sense of conscious, but also sensually, bodily. Mm. Yeah, and I think, um, I think actually Anita's talk will be good next week. Um, uh, Anita and I met here in Wellington yesterday and she, we exchanged books and uh, the cover of her book has a painting which is uh, the garden of, of Goethe's summer cottage in Germany and in the front of the cottage is a sculpture that Goethe designed which is a block, square block with a round sphere, globe on top of it and uh, I need to explain to me it, it symbolizes both dwelling and stasis of the square block and movement with the sphere on top so um, maybe she'll she'll pick up on that and tell us about it but it, it, apparently he wrote poems and this was a big theme in his thinking the combination and finding the balance between stasis and and mobility so you know yeah it's a it doesn't have to be either or but it's a dynamic um, relationship that we all need to find our own balance with And um, Tara, I know you've been working in dwelling and thinking about that a bit, or, or have you sort of, <laughs> not for a while? Um, probably not for a while, although it's uh, just thinking about these discussions makes me think further on it because it's the, you know, it goes back, it goes back to, to roots and roots and this and and um, Jenny Jermaine Maltz is you know uh, dwelling mobile dwellings dwelling you know and yeah I don't know where I was going with that sorry but just sort of I think I really I actually really like the ideas thinking about how we need to have a revival of, of dwelling um, and I, I need to sort of think on that and think through that because I think that was a really interesting point to make and and very worthwhile and thinking through how thinking how we can fit that with this idea of interplace mm -hmm. or multi-place or, or and the other thing I was thinking all the way through as well and it's, it's sort of a bit left field is the some of the, the other stuff coming out of human geography of, of the more than representational and thinking not so much representational but that we are more than uh, a corporeal body because of technology because of the tools that we use and and yet and yet we are still ourselves, but we are more than ourselves at any one point in time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. In, in my book, I took on board some of these ideas and um, went into the post-human non-representational theory territory. And it, it, it takes you in diff where, very different, different territories. Uh, and, and it really makes you think differently. And um, I think that's what's needed. And, um, and, um, I, I think of the, uh, I encountered somewhere in my PhD time reading Deleuze, the, this formula for Deleuze is to add, add, add. You just keep adding more layers because there's always much more than 
to the picture than you think. So um, that gets extremely challenging though, because you keep adding and then um, you end up trying to manage everything and um, it, it gets tricky, but that's why we need new concepts and new, new research um, in this. And um, yeah, so, so, oh, I was gonna mention though with, with dwelling, um, I think some of the research, which, and I've done some myself on slow tourism is an interesting way to, um, or slow mobilities. Um, that's an interesting way to think about this combination of moving and dwelling because that slow tourism calls for a slower uh, approach, which tr tries to resonate with a place and with the culture there. And um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if slow tourism is growing. Um, I know pilgrimage is growing, but that's not necessarily um, a sign of that. But um, perhaps, perhaps it will, but um, further research is needed. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question about that? In your paper, at one point you asked a question, which was, is it possible <clears throat> um, to ever dwell outside media? I think the way you put it was, it's impossible. <laughs> and I thought that was a very interesting contribution to that idea of dwelling in mobility because, it, it, you know, it almost tips you toward that negative side, to me, the negative side of, of media, which is that we can only move with it and therefore mm -hmm. we, will only have, we will only be able to move with it and never be without it which is not particularly conducive to slowing and letting go and just being present and mm. yeah resonate. yeah that is that that idea is in in some of the in the paper or versions of the paper that yeah i came to the idea that we can't we are never outside of media and technology because um you can't um, if you strip all these things away, you don't have the same human being. The human being is co-constituted by its tools and technologies, and you end up with a, a different animal. Um, so, so I think, and, and with the way things are and the way they're going, then the possibilities for dwelling outside completely of a media sphere, I mean, even if you try, there's there are um, frequencies and, um, you know, literally the internet is in the air. Um, and so, yeah, this is um, the ideas of purity and um, a pure human being. I mean, maybe in really remote places with no access at all. In, in, um, but these possibilities for people like us are, you know, we really need to take ourselves to the, somewhere in the South Island or, um, you know, <laughs> or, uh, or deep into the remote wilderness to escape. And, and that's a big move. So 